Kim, what's on your radar? Well, you might have heard about this. This was trending on social media over the last few days. But on Monday, 98-year-old Henry Kissinger spoke at the World Economic Forum in Davos and suggested Ukraine should seek to end the war with Russia by letting go of Crimea and the Donbass. Though Ukraine hasn't had control over these areas for almost a decade, recently, with the power of billions in Western weapons behind him, Zelensky has not only wanted to end the current invasion, but also wants to fight until Crimea and the Donbass are back under Ukrainian control, territories that were lost in 2014. Now, Kissinger thinks this is a bad idea, and he called for the West to pressure Ukraine into a peace agreement that realistically includes letting it go of these territories. According to the Daily Telegraph, Kissinger said, quote, negotiations need to begin in the next two months before it creates upheavals and tensions that will not be easily overcome. Ideally, the dividing line should be a return to the status quo ante. Pursuing the war beyond that point would not be about freedom of Ukraine, but a new war against Russia itself. So Kissinger says he's worried about Europe's long-term stability and fears the growing divide between Russia and the West will cause Russia to further join into a new alliance with China, something he sees as more dangerous than Russia controlling parts of Ukraine. Now, many people agree with Kissinger's sentiments, but many are also shocked that well-known warmonger Harry Kissinger, the man who advocated for the bombing of, quote, anything that moves, the man who expanded the Vietnam War into Laos and Cambodia, backed Pakistan in its war against Bangladesh despite known war crimes, and installed Pinochet in Chile, would actually be the one calling for an end to the war rather than continued escalation. So K Kissinger, maybe you may not know or you know, but he is known or, or thought of as the father of U.S. interventionism. Uh, maybe it went back before him, but still, it's very much his idea. But Kissinger is also well known for what is called a real politic approach to foreign policy. This is taking a more pragmatic or realistic stance, despite what moral implications there might be. So his entire foreign policy ethos was to basically sacrifice anyone for the sake of the best interests of the nation. So actually, his calling for an end to the war in Ukraine is likely not a function of Kissinger softening up at his old age. This is what people were kind of wondering on social media. But actually, it's in line with much of his foreign policy strategy of old. He clearly doesn't view Ukraine as important, at least not as important as Russia sticking with the West rather than strengthening ties with China. But nonetheless, Henry Kissinger of all people is calling for peace negotiations rather than sending endless weapons to Ukraine. So Robbie and Bree, I mean, this this kind of lit up the internet. They, people were falling over themselves, the anti-war crowd saying, I cannot believe, you know, if I am agreeing with Henry Kissinger of all people, who was very much a war, you know, his whole entire foreign policy agenda was, it doesn't matter if we got to go to war, if we've got to bomb people, if we have to uh, do, you know, stage coups, overthrow governments, anything that's best for the United States. And it's not about, you know, his foreign policy um, outlook wasn't about democracy or right. human rights. You know, we hear a lot about that. It was more about what is going to keep America strong, what is going to keep America in the lead, what's best for the country. So a lot of people were really like, what in the world? Why would, nine, you know, has he gotten, you know, he's finally come around at the age of 98 to being more about peace. But the reality is he is really concerned when you actually listen to not only this speech that he gave at Davos, but other things that he said in other interviews He's really concerned about Russia and China, the alliance between the two of the, those two nations. And so he really hasn't changed his foreign policy outlook. He's saying, what, what is Ukraine, right? So how is Ukraine important in the grand scheme of things when if Russia aligns with China, this could completely change the dynamic of geopolitics around the world the power of those two nations together. And, and then we're seeing all of these other nations sort of, sort of um, refuse to join in, like Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, India. A lot of nations are refusing to kind of go along with the Western agenda with Ukraine and instead saying, well, we don't really want to upset Russia and China. So, you know, he's looking at it saying that is going to be way worse for the West, that alliance, than... Uh, Ukraine uh, losing territory or, you know, not having a, a democratically elected Ukraine, you know, if, if they're back under Russian control or something. So 
so I don't really think Henry Kissinger has changed his outlook. I think he's looking at it from still sort of a real politic point of view, which is we just want to stop China from rising. Right, because there's a, a difference uh, that you're getting at exactly between kind of, you know, some people want to paint all sort of in the pro-war camp as the same, but there is a difference between the kind of Bush era neoconservatism that was really ostensibly de be de uh, done, yes, it was going to benefit us to have more democracies or whatever, but it was really done us asserting that it's in those countries' best interests for us to overthrow their governments and, and install regime, the democratic regimes, really because that's what's going to be good for them. Whereas a, the kind of real politic view that Kissinger represented, and I, even someone like John Bolton was closer to, who I have many, obviously, policy disagreements with, but it was, it was more, we have to you know, destroy these governments because they're hostile to us, and we should destroy all governments that are hostile to us if we can. That's the calculus. So that's very different from a kind of a, a neoconservatism that strives to, that, that views the U.S. military's role as to make the world a better place rather than one that should just relentlessly crush anything we perceive to be our enemies. Yeah, I think that the if we can is really weighing heavy in Kissinger's remarks. I think the growing realization that we're not just necessarily facing a direct conflict with Russia, but as we've talked about on this show earlier this week, Biden's recent statements about coming to the military aid of Taiwan also really ratcheted up the stakes here in terms of the new alliances that are happening with these major powers on a global scale. And I, I do feel like this whole thing has the whiff of that uh, internet meme, the worst person in the world makes a good point, <laughs> where you just kind of had to be like, okay, a broken clock is right twice a day and not read too much into it. But it's interesting, I was reading, there was a response from a Ukrainian MP who said, uh, gave a what's described as a polite reply in this uh, CNBC report. He said, I think Mr. Kissinger still lives in the 20th century and we are in the 21st century and we are not going to give up an inch of our territory. That's a Ukrainian member of parliament told, uh, on Wednesday. And I do think that, that reflects uh, this really dug in approach that has existed since the beginning of this conflict, where any conversation about any concession on the part of Ukraine was very quickly framed as not respecting the rights of Ukrainians, Ukrainian sovereignty, and pretending as though increased escalation and prolonging this conflict inured to the benefit of the individuals living in Ukraine who are the ones that are going to have to bear the consequences of this ongoing fighting and war. And I am hopeful that this represents some kind of a adjustment in that conversation potentially about whether or not what America is doing is in fact this kind of like peacekeeping, you know, supportive posture, the way it's being framed now in the media, as opposed to what is actually from, from some people's perspective, an instigation of conflict that is escalating the kinds of human rights abuses that individuals in the country are facing. And what's really interesting is that, you know, Henry Kissinger is calling for Ukraine to kind of drop the idea at this point to take back Crimea and the areas of the Donbass that they have not had any control over for the last eight years. So, you know, there is this escalation, you're right, Brianna, that not only is has the Ukraine perspective dug in, but they've dug in even harder. I mean, at one point it was like, okay, we're not going to concede any extra territory. Now they're saying, not only are, do we want all that territory back, right now Russia controls about 20% of Ukraine. They've made significant land gains. Uh, maybe, you know, it's not half of Ukraine, it's not all of Ukraine by any means, but they have a lot of the eastern territory of Ukraine now. So not only is it about uh, somehow getting that newly gained, like Mariupol, gaining those territories back. But now Ukraine is saying that's not enough. Not only do we want the new stuff you guys have grabbed since February, but we want all the old stuff you grabbed back in 2014 too. That is not going to happen. The people in those areas don't want it to happen. The citizens in those areas. So that's that's a question. That's a, a, a way of thinking. And, you know, uh, and to say that this is this is where we'll, you know, we'll finally negotiate with you. We'll finally have peace talks once you withdraw completely is totally and completely unrealistic. Because Ukraine is feeling very empowered at the moment. It's because we're giving them so many weapons. But what's interesting is that Henry Kissinger is saying, well, OK, maybe just stop at the whole trying to take back Crimea and Donbass. Russia's not going to give back even the land they've gained now. So we have to be even realistic about that. They're not going to give back Mariupol. Are you kidding me? After every, after all the soldiers that they lost, uh, the gains that they've made, it's been too costly. They can't. So the only way, so even Henry Kissinger, even though, you know, he seems to be calling for some sort of peace by saying, don't try to get back Crimea. 
it's still really not enough to actually get to peace at the end, to, to get to a peace point in this conflict. At this point, the only thing that can happen is to concede all the t- land territory that Russia's already grabbed. They're not going to give it back and to say, OK, stop grabbing more. You know, we have to. But that would be viewed as a surrender. But what is the alternative? And Henry Kissinger's point is the alternative is Russia starts pairing up with China, breaks away more from the West. You get a new world order, a new power axis. And that could be even more dangerous for the West and the United States than any sort of trying to save Ukrainian democracy, which, you know, in my opinion, is a farce anyway. There was really no Ukrainian democracy. That's that's a, a total you know, that it's not real. Uh, we staged a coup in 2014, overthrew their democratically elected government, installed a very anti-Russian government. It's oligarchs that have run Ukraine for decades, whether they be Russian-backed oligarchs or Western-backed oligarchs. It is not a true democracy. That's just the reality of it. But nonetheless, so, it, but it is interesting. People on social media were going crazy saying, you know, the anti-war crowd saying, oh my gosh, Henry Kissinger's become anti-war. That's not really what's happened. But uh, I, I just I, I would like to see more people in Davos start talking about an end to this conflict, a realistic one. Mm-hmm. But I, it, here we are still fighting. <laughs> here we are <laughs> still providing weapons, at least, and intelligence. Well, thank you, Kim. And we'll be back with more Rising in just a minute. 